So next, we have uh, Dalia Mauki, uh, distinguished uh, scientist at Chainlink Labs. Uh, the topic is innovation consensus research from Chainlink Labs. Let's welcome her to the stage. Does this work? Yes. Awesome. So really happy uh, to be here today. Um, this will be uh, hopefully an enjoyable talk. No product, no marketing, no entrepreneurship. We will have a talk from uh, Chainlink about some of the cool uh, products we recently launched tomorrow by Lorenz, who's sitting here. And today, I want to talk about just a sample of uh, the research uh, we are doing. And this represents research that generally we do uh, very collaboratively across organizations, across the industry. And it's all about this amazing tool uh, and primitive that we have in this space, the consensus tool. And since I was invited to speak here, I assume you're interested in it. Uh, otherwise, I don't know what else I could talk about. So uh, consensus is really the core of a lot of the systems we build. It allows a network of nodes to act in a coordinated uh, manner, in a unified manner. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, what happens in systems behind the scenes um, to uh, replicate reliably anything that you do on the cloud so that you don't use your files or your emails or anything. But in the blockchain space, it is doing it in adversarial settings. So it brings a network of potentially adversarial participants to reach an agreement. Imagine if we could do it for people. What an amazing tool this is. And today, I want to talk about two recent advances in consensus research. One is Hot Stuff 2. This is a uh, two-phase version of Hot Stuff, and it's also the sequel of Hot Stuff, so Hot Stuff 2. Do you get it? Yeah, you got it. Okay. And the second one is Bobka Chain, which is bringing parallelism and uh, causality, causal ordering, to uh, bring throughput even higher than what Hot Stuff already did. All right, so let's get on to it. Starting with um, Hot Stuff 2. So Hot Stuff 2 starts with the story of Hot Stuff. Uh, I was uh, among a group of people who, in 2019, introduced uh, Hot Stuff uh, as a solution that, for the first time, uh, in practical network settings, uh, achieved optimal complexity, communication complexity uh, cost, and at the same time was simple, uh, borrowed from, uh, uh, you know, looked very much like a blockchain, so it, was, it became pretty developer friendly, and probably was adopted by a lot of industry, mostly due to the simplicity and not so much due to the uh, uh, optimal uh, communication, but both work. And it has its own logo, uh, and even a song, if you go on YouTube, uh, uh, you can hear its own song. And so Hot Stuff 2, in a nutshell, is a two-phase Hot Stuff. It's a two-phase consensus protocol that, like Hot Stuff, doesn't need any leader justification and uh, at the same time moves at the speed of the network, so is responsive. So since this is a consensus talk, there is a chance that I might lose some of you on the details at the rest of the talk. So these are the three uh, main takeaways. It's a two-phase variant, which at the same time does not have a leader proof, does not require the leader proof like hot stuff, and does not require waiting. And to put this in uh, context, let me kind of recall a very brief uh, uh, history with uh, three milestone in uh, consensus uh, research. So starting with the first practical uh, solution that was given, PBFT, uh, for networks that can suffer uh, occasional uh, transient uh, you know, uh, uh, disruptions and uh, delays, uh, PBFT was a solution that had a component uh, uh, that was quadratic every time 
there's a view chain or a leader change inside the protocol. And what that meant was, on the one hand, it's pretty practical for small systems. On the other hand, if you suffer an unlucky succession of failures, one after another, then this quadratic component occurs again, again and again and again, and it could become n to the third, so cubic communication. So for hundreds of nodes, thousands of nodes, tens of thousands of nodes, uh, that becomes uh, prohibitive. But at the same time, it was practical enough in the happy case, and it was responsive. It moved at the speed of the network. Uh, you collect messages and immediately reach a conclusion. Then came Tendermint, completely outside the academic, or almost completely outside the academic world. And we just heard this morning Jay talk about uh, you know, some of the uh, product stories uh, uh, in the history of Tendermint. And Tendermint removed the quadratic component that PBFT had and also simplified the heck out of the protocol. But unfortunately, it also uh, gave up the responsiveness. So it did that by managing the transition uh, of leaders and uh, the view change by weighting the pessimistic uh, uh, largest uh, uh, possible delay in the network. So it was both good and bad. And then came hot stuff, and for the first time we showed that it's possible to have a uh, protocol that doesn't have this quadratic comp component. So in the happy case, it's linear. And even in the worst case, it's quadratic, which is the best we can hope for. There are lower bounds. It is responsive. It doesn't have to wait the pessimistic uh, network delay. But there was a small gotcha. It was three uh, phases. And there was a long line of work. And for the past five years, people have tried to reduce one phase in certain settings, and to optimize the hack out of this quadratic component with all sorts of uh, techniques. And um, I've been asked, uh, presenting hot stuff during these five years and talking to uh, industry that build this, um, do you need the third phase in order to get both responsiveness and remove the quadratic? I said, I cannot prove uh, that you can, but it seems like this is the trade-off. You add one phase and you get these two, uh, two uh, meet together. Um, and then, surprisingly, we observed that actually you don't. Okay, so I'm going to do the impossible, and in 10 minutes, I'm going to try to actually explain uh, hot stuff to, to you. And uh, I will do my best to do it at a high level. I'll wave my hands a lot. It will be very informal. Uh, even if I do lose you, come back in 10 minutes when I present Bob Kuchin. So. A very, very hand-wavy uh, model is we have a network of n nodes. The uh, communication network could go through periods where suddenly uh, there are unpredicted delays, and then it will go back to synchronous periods. So this is known as the, as the partial synchrony model. And in this model, it is well known that the highest resilience you can hope for to reach Byzantine fault-tolerant consensus would be uh, less than a third. So you need n to be 3f plus 1 at least, where f is the uh, maximum number of failures. And what we're looking for, both in theory, but actually also in practice, good solutions would have a happy path, an uh, optimistic uh, path, uh, which is linear. It's essentially um, uh, uh, overhead free. You just send the uh, uh, next uh, block or the next value, and it's decided. And uh, in the worst case, if you do go through this very, very uh, improbable, unlucky succession of failures once in a long, long time, once a year, uh, then you pay quadratic communication cost, which is still uh, tolerable. Um, and in the happy pass, you also want to move as quickly as the network. You don't want to have pessimistic uh, upper bounds. Um, so all of the solutions essentially revolve around this uh, core, which is a two-phase uh, core. And how does it work? Well, you start by picking the leader to help drive pro uh, progress. Um, so let's pick Dan, yeah? He's our leader. Uh, and he's just gonna tell everybody what to do. Yay! But unfortunately, Dan may cheat. He may send you know, different uh, values to different people. And in order to prevent the leader from equivocating, from sending different values, we're going to have the first phase uh, get the leader to uh, ask a quorum in the system to vote for the value it proposes. And since two quorums will intersect, uh, the leader cannot get uh, you know, two different values, two equivocating values to be certified. So this guarantees uniqueness already. 
And the early protocols looked like what we have in uh, the slide here. They were all-to-all -all communication, you know, they were quadratic, but then people showed how you can harness threshold cryptography and linearize it. So you could get a certificate and you can guarantee uniqueness with the first phase in a linear protocol. That's the first phase. But that still doesn't get us consensus because what if uh, Dan walks out for a minute and Kuhn, wherever he is, takes over uh, and becomes the leader. And Kuhn wants to throw away everything that Dan did and you know, start a new conference, pass. Um, uh, so we need to guard the safety of any decision that uh, uh, Dan uh, made. And the way you do it is in uh, introducing another phase. So before anybody accepts the leader as a committed decision, you need to have a quorum that are already locked on that value. And they can guard the safety of the decision. They can always tell the next leader what uh, a unique value uh, to adopt. Um, so in any case of failure, uh, the next leader um, needs to uh, uh, collect uh, information from a quorum and find out, did you get locked on a previous value or not? And I'll get into the detail of this protocol, but there are really two versions, two options to do that. One is the PBFT version. The leader collects information from everybody. Did you get locked or not? And then present it as a proof to justify what it proposes, and then everybody can know, all the nodes in the network can know uh, whether they accept the leader proof or not. And the problem with this, uh, pro so the good thing about this proof is it's responsive. You collect information, you send it, done. You don't have to wait uh, uh, for any pessimistic delays. The bad thing is this proof is a little bit complex, and it's complex both in the English sense of the word and in the theoretical, mathematical complexity sense. So it's complex because it is quadratic, and it's also a little logically complex in code. Uh, and you, know, you, you might, you might uh, uh, incur some bugs. And so as I said, then came Tendermint in 2016 and removed the leader proof. So the leader doesn't justify the proposal. But in order to make sure everybody votes for the leader, the leader waits to hear from everybody. So now everybody will vote because everybody contributed to the leader's decision. So now you don't have a proof, and the leader protocol is completely linear and also simple. But it's not responsive. You cannot just collect messages and immediately move forward. <clears throat> OK, so I already said everything. This is already hot stuff, too. All you need to notice, and I don't know how we missed it, but all you need to notice is there are really two cases here, either irresponsive or not. So it's a simple if statement. And this is an observation not just about hot stuff. This is an observation about all protocols. All they need is a simple if. The leader looks if it gets uh, a... Uh, um, certificate of uniqueness, a locked value uh, from the immediately preceding leader, then it knows it can be in their responsive case and move forward and uh, not wait. And if it doesn't, so long as it doesn't, it's in any case in a non-responsive scenario. And then it's okay to wait. And then you're not losing anything to wait. You don't need to be responsive. You're not in the happy path. So that's it. A simple if is all that you need to manage uh, the uh, leader transition. And again, if you kind of lost me uh, on the details a little bit, please go and read the paper, but this is the main takeaway. Uh, two phases are enough, and this is an observation not about hot stuff, it's an observation about PBFT, about Tendermint, about all of the lines of protocols that try uh, to reach consensus. Just put a simple if to distinguish the responsive from the non-responsive case, and you're done. You don't need the quadratic justification. You don't need the complexity and the complication. Cool. So this was Hot Stuff 2. And um, I wanted to give you a sampler. So I will quickly switch gears um, uh, to move on from Hot Stuff 2. So how can you move on from an optimal solution? So you already have a pretty good solution. And it's optimal and it's friendly. Um, but it's capped. The throughput is capped as at the capacity of a single leader. So the highest you can the, the, the uh, highest uh, throughput, the highest uh, uh, number of blocks you can uh, chug through in a minute is the capacity of a single leader, which is not bad. You know, you could get many, many thousands of blocks this way. But in order to bring that even higher, um, the next promising direction is to harness causal communication, causally ordered communication, Lampert's good old 
causally ordered communication and allow um, uh, higher throughput by uh, introducing, by, by allowing all the nodes to broadcast blocks in parallel and um, all these blocks will become part of the committed uh, uh, chain of blocks in the end. So uh, um, it's uh, sometimes uh, referred to as zero uh, message, zero overhead, zero message overhead protocols. Every message has utility and becomes a block. And the logic, the consensus logic, is encoded through the causal ordering. So the causal ordering forms a direct acyclic graph, a DAG. And that's just a fancy name for causal ordering. And what you do is um, look at the DAG. Every node looks at its local DAG. The causal ordering guarantees that they're all eventually seeing the same DAG. And then they can locally interpret the DAG. And what all of the protocols in, on the DAG are doing, they're writing on the DAG. They look at the DAG, and uh, they're interpreting some of the blocks as leader proposals, other blocks as votes. And then they uh, commit a backbone, which on this slide is shown as this uh, dark uh, green. And the backbone is just a chain of blocks, just like a normal consensus. And these blocks can also reference, causally reference, as predecessors, other blocks. And when they become committed, every block they reference also become committed. So this is a little bit like uncle blocks in Ethereum. But importantly, the logic of consensus is simply uh, encoded implicitly by the structure of the DAG. Unfortunately, existing solutions uh, do, uh, do this with uh, somewhat increased latency compared with standard classical consensus solutions. And so the increased throughput, but they also suffer by uh, uh, higher latency. And they're also, again, some, somewhat more complicated than uh, I would have liked it. And in particular, if you look at uh, state-of-art solutions like, uh, like Bullshark and others, um, to commit a block in the DAG takes a minimum of four chained layers of the DAGs and, and blocks uh, and some complex uh, roles of each one of these layers. So you have the first layer is the block, is the head. The second layer cannot be used to reference that block because it's, it's reserved for previous votes. And then it takes two, two layers for a leader block to actually propose uh, and reference the head of the chain. And then another layer of voting blocks that are voting on the leader proposal to commit. So you get a chain of four blocks. And moreover, each one of these blocks is itself a causally ordered, reliable broadcast protocol. So if you peek inside each one of these blocks, it's a distributed protocol by itself with many messages and steps and uh, delay. And so the, the total latency and complication here is, is non-trivial. And so we are uh, introducing, and today is the first time we're uh, actually talking about it, so this is fresh out of the oven, uh, Babka Chain, which is uh, a new consensus protocol for uh, uh, causally ordered communication, which sort of strikes a middle point between existing solutions and between the classical solution. Like existing solution, it does borrow and embrace this idea of causal communication that allows broadcasts in parallel, which are all contributing to the throughput. So you get high parallelism and high throughput. It's also dug riding. So it's zero message overhead. All the consensus logic is going to be embedded in the structure of the DAG. So there's the simplicity and also utility. But it improves on state of ARP by being a one broadcast consensus protocol. So each block with a leader proposal can immediately commit on the Babka chain uh, DAG, just a single broadcast. And that improves substantially the throughput it also simplifies the protocol. So we don't improve it by making a really complex protocol. We improve it by simplifying it. There are also other relaxations that we do uh, that improve uh, latency compared with existing state of art that I'll uh, gloss over uh, today. The core of Babka chain is a new broadcast primitive, which we call Babka, which stands for Byzantine Broadcast with a Commit Adopt API. And it's also this amazing uh, uh, cake, uh, which is built layers by layer, layer by layer, uh, that uh, uh, we very much like. And just like the Bobka cake, 
Babka peeks inside broadcast protocols um, and observes that are already building by, built by, uh, you know, layer by layer by adding more and more semantics and more and more steps, just the, the existing uh, broadcast. So at the, at the base of the pyramid is uh, just be be best effort broadcast. You just multicast the message to everybody. Then you can add causal ordering by adding predecessors to each message and guaranteeing that you never deliver before you already uh, uh, received all the predecessors. On top of it, um, you can add consistency, which guarantees that the same sender cannot send two messages, cannot broadcast two different messages to different nodes. So this guarantees the uniqueness of the broadcast. And on top of this, um, you can add reliability, which guarantees that if any node delivers, eventually all nodes uh, will deliver. And by peeking inside this, this uh, layered broadcast uh, uh, protocols, which already has these uh, steps, we observe that all you have to do is add a, uh, a thin shim, which, is, uh, which we call babka, that allows to peek inside the state of the broadcast and implement a commit adopt uh, uh, API. And what this commit adopt API guarantees is, again, a very, very familiar notion in distributed computing. So it observes that in order for broadcast to be unique, to preserve uniqueness and reliability, there's always gotta be a quorum of nodes that are uh, locked and know the unique value before it could be committed. We already have that in reliable broadcast. That's a precondition for reliability. And so the commit adopt API allows each node locally to pick at the local state of the broadcast and ask, am I locked already or not? And the guarantee that comes with it is that since a quorum of nodes is required for delivery to happen, if a quorum of nodes peak inside their local node, at least F plus one of them will actually return the lock. Or said differently, you know, the other way around, if a full quorum of two F plus one peak inside the Bobka and say, we're not locked, then there will never be a delivery. And again, this is a local operation built on top of reliable broadcast. It doesn't add uh, uh, messages, it doesn't add, add uh, latency. And using this is enough to guard the safety of consensus decisions with causally ordered communication. So here's the uh, Bobka chain DAG in one slide. On the left is a really simple scenario, really happy case. Uh, layer by layer, a leader sends a proposal. The proposal is sent using Bobka uh, broadcast. It becomes committed immediately, and of course commits all the uncle blocks around it, and that's it. And the next leader uh, follows it, and on and on and on. So you have this backbone of committed sequence of uh, blocks. On the right is the same scenario, but when things didn't go uh, uh, so well, so some nodes didn't receive you know, the second leader's uh, broadcast, and that can happen in a distributed system, but the Babka commit adopt uh, API helped guard the safety. So what happens is nodes didn't get the leader proposal, they probe into their local state, and at least F plus one will adopt uh, the leader proposal, and it will come, become part of the chain. So no matter which node are you, the node that actually saw the original delivery or the node that sees the DAG on um, the right um, with adopted value, with, with the uh, uh, Babka commit adopt uh, embedded value, you will get the same sequence uh, in the end. So to go back to how Babka uh, reduces latency and simplifies. So let's go back to the existing solutions where you had you know, four layers and uh, different uh, specialized uh, interpretations of each layer. And already what we can do is we can replace leader proposal and votes with just a single Babka broadcast. Okay, so already we get rid of one layer. So Babka broadcast is by itself committed, doesn't need additional votes. But also we can get rid of uh, specialized later, uh, layers completely. So that reduces, or removes, you know, the alteration between layers. So that gets rid of another uh, delay, another block uh, layer. And finally, we observe that only leader messages need to be broadcast. All of the other blocks 
in the Babka DAG can be sent with just uh, a normal uh, best effort broadcast with causal uh, ordering. The uniqueness and the deterministic uh, ordering is uh, determined by the backbone. All of the other blocks don't even need all these extra stages. So as a result, we get a substantial uh, reduction in uh, um, uh, latency. And again, I emphasize without complicating the protocol, but by actually simplifying it. So here it is in, uh, in a table in numbers. Uh, Babka Chains uses for leader blocks a single Babka block, which can be implemented uh, in three network trips. And other blocks have to wait for the leader block to reference them, and so they use best effort broadcast, which is just one network trip, and then the next leader uh, references them, and that's another three uh, network trips. Compare that with uh, the best uh, uh, state-of-art solutions right now, uh, like uh, Bullshark, you get uh, uh, substantial uh, latency reduction. So on the left, the picture shows the Bobka chain, uh, which is also simpler, and on the right, you know, state-of-art protocols like Bullshark and others. Cool, so I'm gonna wrap to the beginning where I introduced consensus as this magnificent uh, uh, catch-all tool uh, that you could do everything with. And I actually wanna finish with sort of a call for action uh, to the community. Um, by opening consensus and looking at the steps of the protocol internally, there are actually a lot of useful information and bringing a network of nodes to act in coordination doesn't necessarily always, uh, always means blindly replicating state and transactions. It works great for smart contracts in a virtual world uh, uh, for some settings. But in a lot of other protocols, we know we worked on a lot of protocols in applied cryptography and other places. You need nodes, for example, to operate on confidential information, where you secret share the information. Or you need nodes to have their own information that they attest to, and um, uh, they later uh, coordinate in unity. And Bobka demonstrated a case where, by peeking inside the steps of the protocol, you can get you know, surprising results uh, and new consensus protocols on DAGs. So I think it may be time for us as a community to start working on additional primitives other than uh, black box consensus and um, uh, see what interesting you know, uh, results it enables. So I personally plan to spend uh, time on it in the next, uh, I don't know, X, X years, five years or so, and I welcome everybody to collaborate and uh, talk to me about it. Um, yeah. And I think I have time for questions, if you allow questions in this conference. And if not, thank you very much. Do you have Q&A? You have Q&A? OK. Yeah, I mean, so long as you're comparing apples to apples, it's fine. Uh, when I talk about quadratic communication, I talk about across the network. Um, there's also a strong um, desirable measure, which is balance, uh, so that everybody suffers the same load and you're not bottlenecked on a single leader. Um, that's another measure. But when I talk about quadratic communication uh, in uh, PBFT, or QB communication in PBFT, it's total. And then in hot stuff, the worst case is quadratic, and the happy path throughout the network is linear. Totally. Totally. So you can pay a little bit by latency, and maybe this, what you're saying is this, these communication measures are not really important because everybody in scalable settings, everybody's using gossip networks. This is why what you may want to look at is 
the number of verifications, the number of values that you need to verify signatures on instead of the number of bits or messages, totally. Also, as I said at the very, very beginning, um, communication complexity is for theorists. Maybe we have a few of them in the audience. Simplicity, developer-friendly is really what matters in, in, a lot of, in a lot of ways. Yeah. No, that's, that's right on. I'm really happy with this question, actually. Um, so yeah, there's a real question, first of all, what does it mean to generate block proposal in parallel? Uh, are you operating on the latest state? And does, is it even meaningful? And in a world where we seem to be heading to proposal builder separation, even if a few blocks can be generated in parallel, and it's a big if, I can't imagine, I don't know, 16,000 blocks uh, generated in parallel. So one of the nice things about uh, Babka chain is that we also don't, even though my, my, my uh, picture is displayed, all the nodes being active in each layer, we don't require that. Um, you allow uncle blocks, but uh, they don't have to come from everybody. It could be only a few of them. Um, this is also research. Uh, like I said, come to Lorenzo's talk uh, tomorrow if you want to hear about production system. So this pushes the envelope in research. Um, what, some of the justification for this research is you may want to have more than one block, for sure. Um, there are networks like the uh, Mist and Labs uh, SWE network that actually don't require uh, total ordering on everything. Uh, so high throughput is important for these networks. And I think it's important to understand the trade-offs and then pick and choose what's important for you. But I also have the same question, do you really need parallel throughput in consensus networks. I totally resonate. But if you do, this does it better. <laughs> I don't think we have time, right? Um, I think, ask me in the break. Yeah, yeah. We'll have, yeah, we'll have time to ask questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you.